thing, but I think we should take a step back because the question is, do I have any credibility? Because as I said, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not an MD. Really, the question is, why am I even talking about cholesterol? And the reason is, first of all, very personal. But 25 years ago, I got some bad news that I was at extremely high risk for developing heart disease. And I think the evidence is very strong that the benefit of statins is clearly linked to what's called their pleiotropic effects, their side effects. Statins have a large effect on metabolism. They can reduce inflammation. They can reduce clotting. And it's those side effects of statins that have produced effects benefits in people and it's independent of their LDL levels. Good. Okay, folks, good morning. Welcome. We are very excited today. We have a special guest. Dr. David Diamond is with us. Dr. Diamond is a, I guess, a, I guess out of necessity, become a, a bit of an expert on cholesterol and cardiovascular risk and lipoproteins and whatnot due to your own personal experience. But your original background is in neuroscience, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? That's correct. I've been a neuroscientist for over 40 years. Interesting. Interesting. So you've been doing science for a long time. I guess I know you've got some slides that you wanted to, I, I think you wanted to share with us. So I'll, I think I'll have to, let me just do that. And I think I'll give you this, I have to give you permission to share it, I think. So just a second. Yeah, either I can share my screen or if you would like to uh, run the slides, I can go either way. They'll be able to see Thank me. Thank you, Sean. By have... the way, I, I wanted to say I'm a great fan of yours. Uh, I've learned a lot from you. I love your posts on Twitter which is X now. And so it's really a pleasure for me to be here with you today. I got to tell you, David, it's a mutual appreciation day. But like I said, it's something that, you know, because obviously what you do and, and your sort of expertise informs a lot of the people that I interact with, because people often will have higher cholesterol levels with different various ketogenic carnivore diets, and they're concerned about it. And I have to say, what is the how concerning does it need to be? Do we need to ignore it? Can, or, you know, I tell people not to ignore it, but I think there's a lot of nuance to that. So hopefully we can maybe discuss some right. of that perhaps because you've obviously looked into this in, in far more detail than I have because this is your thing. Yeah, it's my thing, but I think we should take a step back because the question is, do I have any credibility? Because as I said, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm not an MD. So really the question is, why am I even talking about cholesterol mm -hmm. and why should anyone listening to me, you know, believe what I'm saying. And so I think we, we take a step back. And as I said earlier, I got my PhD almost 40 years ago in biology. And my specialty is neuroscience. And yeah, you know, I was a, a career scientist with the VA for over th about 30 years, and just retired recently. And, and biology has been my thing. I've been studying biology all my life. And I've had a controversy free career. I've been, I've got over 100 papers I've published in medical journals. I've been funded by the VA and NIH and a bunch of other organizations. I've also been very well funded by pharmaceutical companies. I've received millions of dollars from the drug companies for my neuroscience research. So I want to get it out there first that I'm a neuroscience first, neuroscientist first. And uh, this has been my career and it's my life as a study of biology. And so the question really people should be asking is, why am I talking about cholesterol? Because I know a lot about the brain. So why am I talking about heart disease and cholesterol? And the reason is, first of all, very personal. But 25 years ago, as my career was really getting going along extremely well, I got some bad news that I was at extremely high risk for developing heart disease. You being an expert in lipids, you would know that you'd want your triglyceride to HDL ratio to be about one to one. Optimal triglycerides really should be below 100. And my guess is yours are below 100. Yeah. And you want your triglyceride HDL ratio about one to one. 25 years ago, I learned that I have familial hypertriglyceridemia, and my triglycerides were 700, <laughs> and my HDL was only about 30. <laughs> so you calculate that ratio, and I'm looking at over 20 to 1 triglycerides to HDL. And going back 25 years ago, when my doctor told me I was at extremely high risk for having a heart attack, I knew a lot about the brain, but that was the first time I had learned that I was at such high risk. I didn't even know what triglycerides were. Uh, for me, this began as a personal venture. And I learned at first, I was, I tried for years. I went on a low fat diet. I exercised, did aerobics like crazy. And all that happened was I got fatter. I was never obese, but I was noticeably fat. My triglycerides just went up to like seven, 800. I finally decided to put my background in biology to good use and decided to start reading textbooks and read papers. 
And I realized the reason why my triglycerides were so sky high was because I was consuming too many carbs. I was patting myself on the back, creating bread without butter. And it turns out it was the bread that I was eating, the ice cream. I had a typical crappy American diet. So once I started cutting back on the carbohydrates, cut back dramatically on carbs, my triglycerides dropped dramatically. So it dropped 75%. My HDL went up 25%. And so my lipids now are far superior. The other thing that happens when you have extremely high triglycerides is they don't even measure LDL because it's uh, adversely affected in the ability to estimate LDL when your triglycerides are so high. So once my triglycerides went down, then it was revealed that my LDL was sky high, and it is still sky high. My LDL now is 200. My total cholesterol is about 300. So now I'm faced with a second problem. I'm reading about how high LDL causes heart disease. So I get my triglycerides down. Now I got a high LDL. What am I going to do about that? This is really where I've been and how we've come here to today. I've had to learn from my own health benefit. What does it mean to have high triglycerides, low HDL, and high LDL? About a dozen years ago, I started learning about how I didn't need to fear cholesterol. I started a class here at University of South Florida called Controversies in Medical Research, and I covered cholesterol issues. I also covered other medical issues in this seminar for pre-med students. I gave a talk to the public and didn't even know it was going to be recorded. Went on the internet, went viral, had hundreds of thousands of views, and that propelled me into appearing as if I was an expert on cholesterol. And in that time, now I'm working with physicians. I'm publishing papers. It's gone beyond just being my own personal venture. This is now, to me, a second career, which I went from reading a few papers to now reading a 1,000 papers on heart disease and cholesterol. So it's not only important to me personally to improve my health, I'm not going giving talks and publishing papers, I think, to share the information that I've learned with other people. And that's how we've gotten here today. Yeah, a lot of us have skin in the game. That's that's the whole reason I'm here. Same thing, not to the extent that I was looking at my own health rather than the health of the many other people which came later. You'd mentioned, and I know you've got a, I guess you have a set presentation, but I have a couple questions that I just just, I wanted to put out there. So I know, I think last year you guys published a paper, I think it was you, and I can't remember who it was, Ben Bickman on there, a couple other folks. LDL, do you need a statin if you're you're low carb? It was, I can't remember the exact title, but something along the line. And the conclusion I think was- Yeah, right Yeah. (laughs) That would come up. That that was a very controversial paper. We made a statement that for someone- And frankly, I'm thinking of another paper, which will be an even stronger statement, which is anyone metabolically healthy, such as yourself, anyone that is metabolically healthy, primary as well as secondary prevention should not be on a statin, even with high levels of LDL cholesterol. So I, you, when you say shouldn't be on a statin, what about the other drugs, PCSK9 inhibitors, you know, the bempedoic acid, some of these other ones are out there. Is it same, the same rationale go behind that or is, or is there some nuance to this? Yeah, this is just shows the power and influence of the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, these drugs are distorting the natural physiology for absolutely no reason whatsoever. First of all, I, I want to make the strong statement. There's absolutely no reason to lower cholesterol. There is no benefit to lowering your cholesterol by any means at all, whether it's diet or drugs. There's no evidence that lowering cholesterol per se has any real benefit. Now, the PCSK9 inhibitors, they're distorting the metabolic physiology. What they're doing is changing their receptor density on the liver cells so that the liver cells now are accumulating more cholesterol from the blood. And where's that cholesterol going? Cardiologists love it that you can lower your cholesterol. It's not disappearing. What's happening is that cholesterol is getting jammed into the liver cells because it's increased the density of the LDL receptors. I have little doubt that ultimately we're going to see some serious adverse effects with the PCSK9 inhibitors. The latest drug that the darling of the pharmaceutical company is the bempedoic acid. This is just an awful drug that changes the liver physiology. And they love it because it's not going to cause muscle damage. But what it's actually doing is increasing uric acid. It's increasing gout. It's increased, having a significant adverse effect. And this is how people distort the findings. Both Stephen Nissen and Marie Navarre, both cardiologists who are leading figures, 
when they talk about the benefits they use, you know I've present this relative risk. So they'll talk about a 15 to 20% benefit with bampadoc acid. And they'll say the adverse effects are only for one to 2% of people. That sounds really impressive, but they're distorting the findings. They're not emphasizing the adverse effects of these drugs. And if you want, I'll briefly talk about relative versus absolute risk. Yeah, sure. That's a good review. I, I, I think some people will definitely benefit from understanding the difference between the two. So let's just say, and this is very common, it's relatively rare, actually, in most studies in which people actually have heart disease. The majority of people, I, I say, are, are rather uncooperative. They don't have heart attacks in these studies. So you have a typical study in which your, your uh, um, placebo group, you'll have 98% of them don't have a heart attack. So there's a heart attack in only 2%. And in the drug-administered people, 1% will have a heart attack. So the real difference between doing nothing and taking the drug is that 1% of the people don't have a heart attack. Okay, that's called absolute risk benefit. But when you go from 2% to 1%, that's a 50% reduction. And that's called relative risk. Now, if you're working for a drug company, if you're benefiting from profiting by uh, sponsorship from a drug company, such as Steve Nissen and Anne-Marie Navarre, which one are you going to choose? Are you going to tell people that there's a 1% reduction in heart attacks or a 50% reduction in heart attacks? They both use the relative risk number. And so they're going out saying bempedelic acid reduces heart disease, heart disease events by 20%. That's the relative risk effect, which actually their absolute risk is about 1% to 2%. What are the adverse effects? You've got 1% to 2 to as much as 5% increase in people diagnosed with gout, people that have high uric acid, gallstones. Now, what do they say? Only 1% to 2% of the people have gallstones. Now they're giving the absolute risk of harm not as relative risk, but as absolute risk. So they're playing games with the numbers. Bottom line, what I want to emphasize is there is a small benefit of statins. And in some people, that benefit is rather large. And what I reason why I have some slides that I want to show you is that I think the evidence is very strong that the benefit of statins is clearly linked to what's called their pleiotropic effects, their side effects. Statins have a large effect on metabolism. They can reduce inflammation. They can reduce clotting. And it's those side effects of statins that have produced effects, benefits in people, and it's independent of their LDL levels. Yeah, it's, you said there's no benefit for anyone reducing their cholesterol, which is a very strong statement for sure. You, obviously, you, you would get, and you do get a lot of pushback on that. And even in someone who is, Met metabolically unhealthy, someone who's diabetic with hypertension and chronic inflammation, and they have sky high cholesterol, there's still no benefit to reducing that. Is that your position? No. So I said for someone who is metabolically okay. healthy, okay, so sorry. someone who is diabetic is not metabolically healthy. You're, when people go carnivore, the beautiful thing is people are no longer diabetic. They're able to control their blood sugar, bottom line, by changing their diet and lifestyle. Yeah, what happens for someone that is diabetic and they're metabolically unhealthy is because of that high chronic blood sugar, they are triggering inflammation and clotting, which obviously is damaging. They're getting what's called glycation, which is that glucose literally attaches to proteins without an enzyme. It's a very rare process in the body that doesn't require an enzyme. So the glucose molecule attaches, for example, to HbA1c, which is a hemoglobin molecule. When that happens, the hemoglobin molecule doesn't work very well because anytime glucose attaches to a molecule, it's not able to bind. It's not able to function very well. And that's what the A1c value is. The higher your A1c, it's telling you basically how much non-functional hemoglobin you have. So when people have diabetes and have high chronic blood sugar, this is very damaging. And one of the things that it does is it increases clotting which is why people who are diabetic have much greater risk of heart attacks and stroke. The statins are able to reduce clotting. There's even some evidence even with stress, the statins will reduce that clotting potential, reduce the fact that platelets attach to each other. And that's the reason why there is a benefit for people who take statins, people who are unwell, metabolically unwell, people who have diabetes, people who are 
obese, uh, people who smoke, people who have hypertension. All of these people basically are in a hypercoagulant state. It's, so that's why I'm saying it's not the LDL. The statin is having a benefit, but basically reducing clotting. And so what I would propose is, and has never been done, is to compare an anti-inflammatory agent, an anti-clotting agent, anti-platelet activity agent versus a statin and see in those people with diabetes, is there a re reduction in coronary events? So and that study has not been done. Do we have data on things like aspirin? Because aspirin was plugged for a long time. Aspirin has anti-thrombotic properties and so on and so forth. And I'm sure they've had studies on that in diabetics is maybe not directly comparing them to statins, but we should have some data on that, I would assume. That's what I'm saying. There is some benefit of aspirin. Now, aspirin is only one component <clears throat> in reducing the coagulation. So coagulation is actually a very multi-level uh, process. There's also um, a, a reduction of clotting, a, a natural state in which you are always making clots, and then you have what's called fibrinolysis, in which you have to then reduce clots. And so what you have are people that are not able to reduce the clots, break up the clots that are in their body. And so what I'm saying is, yes, there is evidence of an of a, of a aspirin benefit, particularly for our secondary prevention, for people who have already had stroke or heart disease. What I'm saying is, if we had a head, and of course, aspirin has no effect on cholesterol, I would propose that a head-to-head -head challenge of aspirin, as well as other antiplatelet agents, versus statin, you would not see any statin difference, any statin benefit. Interesting. And I don't know if you saw, David, there was a study that came out. This was published on the 19th, so a couple of days ago, from Sweden, looking at centenarians. And the risks, the, basically what they showed were the ones that were most likely to reach old age, on average, had a, to reach 100, had an average LDL, or sorry, total cholesterol of 243, which is well above what we're told to have. And then also their glucose was low. It was like 91 milligrams per deciliter on both of these. So it's like it confirms that glucose is important. Maybe cholesterol is of lesser relevance. There are people out there. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm really, I'm glad you brought that up. And that's why I, uh, I like to have slides because I like to do more than just talk about these findings. Because what you just mentioned is actually related to a paper that I've published. And it's actually one of the first slides that I'm going to show is that high levels of cholesterol are healthy. People with high cholesterol actually living light, long, normal lifespan. And in fact, elderly people with the highest cholesterol live longer than people with what's considered to be the optimal cholesterol, which is below 200. So what people don't appreciate, cardiologists only look at cholesterol as blocking arteries. And that's why I have a picture here of hypercholesterolemia. But immunologists know that cholesterol is a part of our immune system. People with high cholesterol, and I've got a slide because I like to actually quantify this. People with high cholesterol are much less likely to develop and die of cancer as well as other infectious, disease, as the infectious diseases. Um, so I, I want to get across this message that high cholesterol is healthy. And so it's been demonized by an industry, by both the food and the drug industry. And so we should not fear cholesterol. We should welcome having high cholesterol. How high, David? What, is there like a total cholesterol, 250, no 300? There is absolutely it, it can be no limit to how high your cholesterol can be and still be healthy. Interesting, yeah. I know that's got to be surprising because obviously you're not going to learn that in medical school, that's for sure. And when you look at, for example, I have the European Atherosclerosis Society. They have this massive paper, people always referring to it. It was published in 2017. LDL causes heart disease. Now, first of all, just because people are very well sponsored by the drug industry doesn't mean they're wrong. And I also, I want to say I've been very well funded by drug companies and doesn't mean that you can't trust anything I say about the brain and drugs. But you need to be skeptical anytime you see strong sponsorship by the drug companies. But second, when I look through the paper in which they're saying LDL causes heart disease, I realize how they have manipulated the findings. They've been very selective in how they present the findings. But you have to realize we're talking about a trillion dollar industry. We're talking about the food industry that depends on saying high LDL causes heart disease. How do you sell Cheerios, which is basically such an uninteresting cereal? 
And the commercials tug at your heartstrings by saying, I'm eating Cheerios because I love my grandkids and I want to be around for them. And so I'm lowering my cholesterol. It's really important to see how connected industry is with this belief that cholesterol causes heart disease. Yeah, sure. There's conflicts of interest in there. And now you say it because what a lot of people will say, a lot of cardiologists will say, full stop, elevated serum cholesterol causes heart disease. It is necessary. It's sufficient. You don't need anything else. It can do it by itself. Doesn't matter right. if it's oxidase or gly glycated. It's just L number more particles equals more disease. No other questions. There's no other nuance to that. How do you how do you have people that are so far apart on this? I, I do find it fascinating. The word causal becomes very complicated when you're talking about heart disease. They will say LDL causes heart disease, except when it doesn't. And I say that. And, and they all agree with that. It causes heart disease, except when it doesn't. And so you have people that have extremely high cholesterol, and that's what my first few slides are. And I want to—I really want to quantify this because I don't want you to just hear my opinion. I'm, a, I'm an empirical scientist. Everything I present is based on an objective assessment of the science. I have no bias. I have no books to sell. I don't even have a website. This is really just, again, do, am I concerned that my total cholesterol is 300? No. Am I concerned my LDL is 200? No. What I need to be concerned about really is blood sugar, blood pressure. These are the critical factors. When I say that high LDL causes heart disease except when it doesn't, I think it actually be illustrated. We, we take a look at the first two slides. Yeah, of course. And I think it's not working when I go to display mode. So I'm just going to have to show it in this format. So you're seeing the small slides on the side, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is where the foundation of where it came from that people believe cholesterol causes heart disease. So you have this disorder, which is relatively rare. Less than 1% of the people, the population, have what's called familial hypercholesterolemia. And what happens is they have impaired binding of cholesterol, specifically LDL cholesterol, to their receptor. And the end result is they have extremely high blood cholesterol. Now, one way to think about this is it's because there's re – cholesterol is so important to cells that because there's reduced binding of the LDL to the receptor, the liver ramps up LDL production. Because cholesterol is so important, that's why it makes more. That's why we have high blood cholesterol, because less is able to get into the cells. And so you have high cholesterol in the blood. And in this first one, it shows, this is found in the first half of the 20th century, that you know, you've got cholesterol in the artery, in the artery wall. It's pretty logical. High cholesterol in the blood, cholesterol in the plaque. It must be that cholesterol seeps into the artery to then make it grow with this plaque which ultimately becomes a thrombus, which grows and grows and then either chokes off the artery or then explodes and releases itself into the artery and people have a heart attack and die. It's a very simple concept. The, and in fact, in the next slide, you'll see how that was ancient. This is the current work in which they're saying, if you have extremely high cholesterol, you're looking at dying or having a cardiovascular event at a relatively young age. This is conventional cardiology. Okay? that you'll see from the American Heart Association, which I really believe the quote from Nadir Ali, in which he said, the American Heart Association, a cardiologist, the American Heart Association is the most corrupt organization in the world. They're very heavily sponsored by dozens of drug and food companies. So I really want people to take a skeptical view of what I'm presenting in this slide. And I was skeptical because when we look now at the science, you would predict that people with extremely high cholesterol, we're talking three, 400 total cholesterol, they really should be di all dying young because their arteries should be just chock full of cholesterol. And here was the first study that looked at people that had cholesterol, typically of 250 to 300 or more, and they're living normal, healthy lives. And it's an ancient study, but I always say good science doesn't have an expiration date. So here's this massive study looking at people, and you're talking about people in their 70s and 80s without heart disease. And then probably if we had a modern assessment of these people, they'd have zero coronary calcium. 
and they're healthy. This makes no sense if we're talking about people with high cholesterol getting their arteries clogged. Now, granted, it's an ancient study, but there's nothing wrong with it. And now let's look at a modern study. This actually was done by people who are strong statin advocates. So understand, if they have any bias, it's for showing that high cholesterol is unhealthy. So these are people who are using modern techniques to confirm that these people have extremely high cholesterol. And it is true. And you see this in the first few decades of life. A slight, this is looking at the rate of death. So 1.0 is the rate of death in the general population for people of that age. And there is a slight increase in death in people in the first four decades of life. But notice there's no asterisk there, which means only a small subset of these people are dying prematurely. But look at the strange thing that's happening as people are older. There is a reduction. I don't know if you can see as I'm pointing out, a reduction in the rate of death in those years in which people are at the greatest risk of dying of heart disease. And in fact, for someone 70 years of age in the next decade, you're 40% less likely to die compared to the general population. And so if the hypothesis is that a high LDL alone is going to cause premature death, then this finding makes no sense. It doesn't fit at all with the hypothesis. Now, why is it these people are less likely to die? As I said earlier, okay, and let's focus on the people in their 70s. And this is from the same study. We look at what are these people dying of? They showed the rate of death based on different causes. And so people in their 70s have no difference in their rate of cardiovascular disease. Now, a subset of these people were for a period of time on statins. Okay, and so that there is no difference in their rate of death from cardiovascular disease. The statins have no effect and even possibly increased rate of death of cancer. There's no benefit of statins to these other causes of death. Look at the rate of cancer deaths in these people who are in their 70s. Dramatic reduction in cancer and all other causes such as with infectious disease. My point here is that if you look at the people who are most vulnerable, if you're saying high LDL is going to kill you at a relatively young age, then this must force a change to the hypothesis that a high LDL alone is not killing these people. And in fact, it is actually resulting in a reduction in all-cause mortality in people with the highest cholesterol. Hey, David, if someone has, could it be a dependent variable? If someone has all these other metabolic issues, say they're diabetic and they've got high blood pressure, is in that situation, does it make sense to, to lower LDL cholesterol in that particular situation? So let me hammer away at this. It's a very reasonable question you're asking. FH people are at risk for heart disease. They are at greater risk for coronary events. We're talking about death here. We have published, and I think I, I have a slide on this later. I've been working with Ushi Rabinskov and Malcolm Kendrick and others, and we've reviewed the literature because what you're saying is logical. Still, having that high LDL and they're diabetic, maybe it would make sense to lower your LDL. And the answer is, what is it that causes these people to die? And it's a few slides down. If you look at the literature, which is what the American Heart Association does not include in their reviews, but we have published this in medical journals, the subset of people with FH that die prematurely of heart disease are the ones that have a genetic predisposition for hypercoagulation. They have stickier platelets. They are the ones that have more clotting or they have less fibrinolysis which means to break up the clots. And it's independent of their LDL levels. So what is killing a person that has FH or anyone that's also diabetic? What's killing them is their high blood sugar or their hypertension. And that is independent of their LDL. So if you had a drug that only lowered LDL, had no other side effects, then you see almost no benefit 
essentially no benefit whatsoever. And that's why, and I think we can get that in a few slides, because what I hate is when people just talk and they say, believe me. This is why I like to actually show our published studies. I show the data from other people. So let me get to here in the next slide, because I'm talking about FH. And a lot of people say, FH is rare. I don't have familial hypercholesterol. I mean, what about me? So this is a paper we published. We reviewed every study on elderly people, that is people over 60, with high LDL versus low. And there was not a single study, and this is like over 100,000 people were included in all these studies in our systematic review. What you find is the people with the highest LDL over 60 years of age live as long, and the majority of people lived longer than those with low LDL. Now, this is amazing to me because people who want to support the idea that LDL is still harmful, they'll immediately say it's inverse um, causation. And it is a fact that when people are dying, for speci specifically dying of cancer, in the year before they die of cancer, your LDL does drop. Or you go in the hospital and you have sepsis infection, LDL drops. Because LDL is actually involved in the immune system. And so it's really used by the immune system and you have less LDL. But these are looking at studies that go back 10 to 20 years. And you compare people with low LDL to those that have high LDL, even if you look at people 70 years of age and then look 10 to 20 years later, the people that have the highest rate of survival are those that have the highest LDL. And so this is for the general population as well as those with hypercholesterolemia. Now, I know this surprises people because they're not used to this message. But again, if we look at the immune system, and that's in this slide, the immune system uses lipoproteins. Lipoproteins being LDL as well as HDL. Because the immune system has LDL that works along with white blood cells to eliminate bacteria and viruses and precancerous cells. And so I just put a couple of reviews here, and I put older ones, like this one from 96. I put that there to show you that we have known this for decades. And I underlined, LDL protects against endotoxins and gram-negative infections. That, in fact, the LDL binds to the bacteria, allowing the white blood cells then to eliminate the bacteria. So when we took take a holistic approach to cholesterol, we realize it's not only essential for producing hormones, producing steroids, producing vitamin D, it's also a critically important part of our immune system. So there is no intrinsic harm to having high LDL. Yeah, I, I, I was just, you, you mentioned inverse causality or reverse causation because they'll often say the reason these people have higher mortality with lower cholesterol levels is because they're in the process of dying. But again, that study I pointed out that was published two days ago, basically they have data going back 35 years. And I'm like, that means you, you, you mean they were dying 35 years ago with the centenarians? Right. So it doesn't right. make sense when you have such a long follow up. But what about one of the other oft used? thoughts on this is the concept of Mendelian randomization studies. They're showing that you've got these, these genetic studies that show that people that are in this particular subset with higher cholesterol genetically are going to die more. What do you say to those types of arguments? There's a foundation of Mendelian uh, randomization, the idea that you can identify a gene that people have different forms of a gene. And if it affects the LDL, and they live longer or shorter, then this is almost like it's a controlled study. And so all these studies are terribly flawed because they don't realize that once you have a change in, in one gene, you're changing other aspects of physiology. So I've already been talking about an FH. They talk about that as a pure genetic disorder, and it's not because it is a fact that people that have the impaired LDL receptor, which is genetic, the people who are having heart attacks have a secondary um, physiological problem. They have a secondary genetic anomaly, which I actually am quantifying. I want to show you this. I don't want you to just take my opinion for it. 
the subset of people that have FH, that have the heart disease, have a secondary disorder. And that's related, again, to clotting. And so the other thing is they're very selective, these people, about what they want to point out. So you have some people that have PCSK9 um, genetic anomalies, and they'll point out how at a relatively young age, they'll have fewer coronary events. They don't talk about longevity. These people don't actually live longer, and they don't look at other aspects, such as whether they have high or low triglycerides. There's so much more to this. What's happened is you really have this cottage industry in which basically their careers are dependent on focusing just on the LDL receptor and reporting just what benefits their already determined view, which is only to look at coronary events. They're typically not looking at overall health. Um, they're not looking at overall longevity. Now, related to this, let me get to the next slide because I think the next couple of slides are related to what we're talking about. Here we have people that have hypercholesterolemia, and they're on a statin. And we have two groups, and this shows why I'm saying the LDL is irrelevant. When you look here, so you're looking at major coronary events, and you've got two groups of people, extremely high cholesterol, which is now reduced with a statin. And you look over 10 years. The group here in red, over that 10 years, they have no events. The groups in green and blue, they have events. 20% of them have coronary events. First of all, it makes no sense if you're talking about LDL, because here I show the LDL levels in these two groups, which are equivalent. There's no statistical difference between the group having the events here and the group not having events. And what is the best measure of whether or not someone's going to have a heart attack? And that's coronary calcium. And we've known this for over 20 years. And we look at the group that has the coronary events, and they've got it here, extremely high coronary calcium. The group without events, they have zero coronary calcium. And this has been shown study after study to be pretty much independent of LDL levels. If you really want to look at what's causing coronary events, it's calcium seeping into the arteries. And what's related then to the higher coronary calcium? That's on the right. When you look at the people who are having coronary events, they have got significantly higher fasting glucose, approaching diabetes level. Whereas the people here in red who don't have the coronary events, they have nice low fasting glucose below 100. Really, again, what is the demon on your plate? It is that food that raises your blood sugar. And this shows that the events are unrelated to the LDL. Related to that as well, next slide. When we look at people with extremely high cholesterol, we published this in BMJ a few years ago, a review of people with FH and the dietary recommendations in which we specifically criticized the American Heart Association for having very poor, they are still recommending people be on a low fat diet, that they prefer margarine over butter and they not eat red meat. We wrote this specifically to say that because someone has high cholesterol does not mean you should not have food with high cholesterol. This is very relevant, particularly to the carnivore community, because if you have high cholesterol, the American Heart Association is telling you not to eat red meat, not to eat food with cholesterol. So let's look at people with extremely high cholesterol. Ancient paper, because we've known this for decades, if your insulin is low and your waist size is low, that's your baseline. And that's for people who don't have high cholesterol. Now you look at people with extremely high cholesterol, and this is published so early, at least most of these people are not even on a statin. If you've got low insulin and you're not overweight, there's no significant difference in the rate of coronary artery disease compared to the general population that is healthy. This first finding is crucial because these people have high LDL, but they are metabolically healthy. They've got low insulin and they're not overweight. Once you get to people who have high insulin, basically diabetic, type two diabetic, and they're overweight, look at that dramatic increase in events. They're over seven times more likely to have a heart attack, coronary artery disease, compared to people here who are healthy, and also compared to hypercholesterolemia people who are healthy. 
this is why it is so important to target the critical metabolic elements that are actually causing heart disease. And again, that's brought out by hypertension and hyperglycemia. The LDL is equivalent across the board. It's the other factors that really make the difference. The sort of the jaded skeptic in me says, once the drugs become profitable, i.e. things like GLP-1 agonists being used more widespread to lower you know, lower glucose, you might see a change in the, the actual cause of heart disease because they can make more money on that perhaps. We'll see if that plays out or not, but that's my, that's what I'm thinking. We'll yeah, see. No, I think it, we will see about the GLP agonists if ultimately we see side effects that come out with long-term use. I am more of an advocate and for my own health, chose not to take medication and instead to dramatically cut back on my carbohydrate consumption, which I think 25 years later, I'm now 66, and I, I think has helped me to be far healthier than I was 25 years ago. But I understand the appeal of taking medication to, to lower your blood sugar and to lose weight. We don't know, ultimately, long-term side effects. What? Why LDL cholesterol or cholesterol in general, HDL, all the different subtypes have a role, some of it in the immune system. Why is it that some people see it go sky high? What is, what, what is the physiologic mechanism behind that? Do we know why one person who eats a diet will go have no effect and other people that will shoot yeah. up super high? Is there thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And there have been some people who have, who I think are more scholarly or address this specifically. So Nadir Ali, uh, who I'm sure you're familiar with, mm -hmm. has actually talked about it. Dave Feldman, I think it's extraordinary that we've got an engineer, someone outside the field who has addressed this extremely well. We need to think of LDL as a transport um, structure. So LDL is basically providing the cells of the body with not only cholesterol, but with triglycerides, with antioxidants. So we just need to think about how the VLDL first packaged in the liver, which ultimately becomes LDL. If we just think of it as an energy transport structure, there are different ways in which our physiology needs to do that. Either we can increase concentration for depending on your genetics and your diet, and it may clearly depend on your diet. So we do find it's very consistent. When people eliminate meat in their diet through LDL drops, this is the great appeal of becoming a vegetarian. This is why vegetarians strongly advocate for LDL causing heart disease, because really the only difference between vegetarian diet um, and other diets, as far as appearing to be a benefit, is a significant drop in LDL. And so it, it may very well have to do with the nature of the food you're consuming, how much saturated fat you're consuming, which then gets packaged ultimately into the LDL. But I would say it's simply an anomaly that it's ultimately irrelevant. And I'm going to substantiate that because, frankly, I don't think it matters whether your diet has no effect on LDL or increases it. It's very rare in which someone will go low carb, especially if they go carnivore, and their LDL actually drops. That's extremely rare. Typically, the LDL doesn't change or it goes up. And I don't think we know exactly what the mechanisms would be, but bottom line I'm saying is it doesn't matter. Interesting. So let me, I want to substantiate a point I made before, because I really hate it when people will say something, especially in the scientific debate, people will say something and they're skewing the data to support their point. As I said, I have no horse in the race here. I, I really just want to show you important studies that are being ignored. And I find it remarkable. John Castelline is the world's leader in promoting statins and the world's leader in, in stating that LDL causes heart disease. And I, I interact on Twitter with people and I specifically interacted with him. I pointed to this study of his, you see him as the senior final author. This is such an important study. These are people who have hypercholesterolemia. Look at how high their cholesterol is. It's 300, over 350, their total cholesterol. And I put, and the LDL is almost 300. And you've got two groups. These are middle-aged uh, people, I think probably men, in which you're looking when their cholesterol is not controlled. 
and I've drawn these arrows to show what's recommended. Total should be over under 200. LDL should be below 100. And you've got two groups. Um, in red, you've got those diagnosed with coronary heart disease, that's CHD. And in blue, no coronary heart disease. And there's no difference in their total cholesterol or LDL. There's slight difference in their HDL triglycerides. But what really matters is they have an additional genetic anomaly, and that's their prothrombin gene. So there are different forms of a gene. You can have a gene that causes you have blue eyes or brown eyes. That's a polymorphism. A subset of people, and this goes for people with hypercholesterolemia as well as the general population. This is for everybody. If you've got a particular form, the G2020-10A gene, whether you have hypercholesterolemia or not, you have more clotting. You're at greater risk of having a heart attack. And so in this study, they show that the people that had the G2210A form of prothrombin, which is a clotting protein, they're over two times likely to have a coronary event compared to those that didn't have it. And I presented this to John Castellan. I said, your own work shows that this was independent of their LDL levels. <laughs> and at that point, he blocked me. So we no longer interact on Twitter. And this is the frustrating thing for me. I'm not looking for trouble. I'm not a confrontational type person. I'm just a scientist. I look at this and say, how can you say LDL causes heart disease when these other factors are so much more important? Yeah, it's this is his own published work. I'm just wondering what would compel him outside of this this particular finding. He's got to have other reasons why he thinks it's caused it. What they talk about the fact that we've got LDL receptors in the vascular wall. We've got we've got different mechanisms by which it's deposited in the uh, endothelium or the subendothelium. Well, let's address that. This is the hand waving that you have. Yes, you have receptors. What they have proposed, and this is really for almost a century, is that there's a dose response in which LDL, as the concentration gets higher, finds its way into the artery wall. It just seeps in. And that's not how biology works. The LDL will bind to a receptor, and the receptor basically controls how much can get into a cell or into the artery wall. Now, what is so clear is that when you have damage to the artery wall, it's really like any other wound. When you have damage to the artery wall, when the endothelium, which is that thin layer of cells that is in our artery wall, when it's damaged, what you have then is access into that artery wall of viruses and bacteria and glucose to bind to those cells, and in comes cholesterol to help repair the tissue. If you think about the wound must precede cholesterol, get the plaque being developed. And in that plaque, calcium, and you actually see remnants of bacteria. There's a very high association of infection with heart disease. And so when the bacteria now gain access to our artery wall, what you then have in that wound are white blood cells. And along with the white blood cells comes the LDL. The metaphor is really so appropriate to think of cholesterol as the fire, the uh, fire officers, the firemen, the firewomen who come into the fire to put it out. Okay, the, the metaphor is so appropriate to think of the police at the scene of the crime. The cholesterol doesn't trigger damage to the endothelium; it comes after the damage has occurred, and this is where they completely ignore. That cholesterol doesn't simply seep into the artery. It is there only following damage. Yeah, and the, the, I'm familiar with Malcolm Kendrick's work. I've read his book. I've interviewed him as well. And it, it seems like the damage is either hyperglycemia or an autoimmune condition or hypertension or whole whole right. host of reasons why damage is occurring. And, that's, and you would say that is the inciting primary event. And then these other things are all subsequent to that. Is that fair to say? Now, what happens is when you've got increased blood sugar or, or hypertension, I was looking for firefighters before, by the way. When you have increased blood sugar, the blood is thicker and viscosity is therefore greater. 
Now, we have an internal blood vessel system in our artery walls. Our arteries are so thick that the, the oxygen actually can seep in all the way from inside the blood vessel all the way through. So we even have this microvasculature. And the hypothesis is presented, and this is called the vas vasorum. The hypothesis is that the blood gets so thick that it actually blocks the microvasculature inside the artery wall. And this is really interesting. The histology of people who actually die relatively young, and you can see the initiation of atherosclerosis, you actually see that atherosclerosis is not developing right at the edge of the artery wall where it faces the blood. It's developing well into the artery wall. And that's where the, the vasovasorum is. And so it's death of tissue, necrosis, in the middle of the artery because that microvascular gets blocked because you've got clotting and you've got thickened blood. And then the cholesterol, again, comes in along with the white blood cells to deal with this damaged tissue. And I think, and I have that, this is just another study showing clotting in people with FH. People who have more fibrinogen, people with factor eight, more clotting factors, and this goes back even before there were statins. So these are people with extremely high cholesterol, equivalent LDL, the difference is clotting. The literature is out there and this is not something you're gonna hear. I looked at the review of the American Heart Association of what causes heart disease, and this study is not mentioned. The word clotting is not even mentioned. But let's get to what I was just talking about. When you look at viscosity, that's the thickness of the blood. The people who have thicker blood have more coronary events. And people who have thicker blood, for example, have more fibrinogen. That is a critical protein that causes clotting. Now, what these people did was a beautiful study. They filtered out the fibrinogen from blood and studied this in a, in a test tube. And when they eliminated the fibrinogen, leaving the LDL in, there's a dramatic reduction in how thick the blood was. Now, when they eliminated LDL, along with triglycerides, which will also thicken the blood, there was not a significant reduction. That's the blue bar here. This is so important to realize. Some people will be predisposed to develop heart disease, not because they have high LDL, but because they have more fibrinogen, more factor VIII, more prothrombin. It's also very important to realize these proteins are essential for us to make clots. By themselves, they don't make clots, but they are triggered by stress, by adrenaline, by high blood sugar, by hypertension. When that happens, they cause platelets to become sticky to produce clots. And I think it's very important to mention. So I study stress in my normal career. When we get stressed, when we get angry, that triggers our platelets to, to aggregate. We literally make our blood clot when we get stressed. And that's why stress is associated with heart disease and it has nothing to do with cholesterol. It's causing activation of proteins such as fibrinogen. And this was one paper we published, reviewing the FH literature. And this is why I say it's not the LDL, it's the clotting. And yes, Malcolm has a beautiful book, The Clot Thickens, which I highly recommend. And we published this together, which will be looked at the literature, at the subset of people with extremely high LDL, the ones that had coronary events are the ones that had coagulopathy. That is, the people who had more fibrinogen, more factor VIII, okay, or, or inability to reduce clots, that's fibrinolysis. Now that's for the people with FH. What about the general population? That's here for the general population. Fibrinogen, now a lot of people are gonna go out and, oh, I gotta test my fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is one of the best measures to tell you about the incidence of heart disease and stroke. It's independent of age. And so what you see here on the left is a significant relation between fibrinogen and the incidence of heart disease, and on the right is incidence of stroke. Realize, fibrinogen by itself is benign. It is there to help us. You've got to have fibrinogen to make clots. But you combine fibrinogen with these activational factors, such as the blood sugar and the stress, that's when it blocks arteries. And this is independent of, again, independent of cholesterol. 
Yeah, outside of I, I've I've heard Malcolm talk about some of these different clotting things that make you more hypercoagulable. And one one thing he pointed out was triglycerides also have a role in there. And so that's one of those another reasons why you might want to lower your triglycerides because it does seem to right. Have triglycerides that. really thick in the blood. If someone with very high triglycerides, you can actually see the blood is more yellow and it is really thick. So having hypertriglyceridemia, which is what I had, is really unhealthy. Now, I think it's important to say, is LDL always safe, no matter how high it is? And this is where people just talk about LDL-C too often. And that's your total cholesterol in all the LDL particles. And the experts have basically dropped LDL-C. And they talk about LDL-P or ApoB. And this is the kind of the games that they play. You look at your blood test and you have a high ApoB you say, oh, that's really bad. I need to go on the statin. What you need to do is look at the, in a sense, the quality of your LDL particle and how it is affected by your metabolism. This is where I say metabolism is crucial. When a person has low triglycerides, someone is healthy, low blood sugar, low triglycerides, not uh, hypertensive. When the liver packages the VLDL, very low LDL. It's what's called large buoyant LDL. And that's on the left. And that's part of a healthy metabolism. When you have someone that has high triglycerides and high blood sugar, that LDL is structurally different. That LDL is now called small dense LDL. That is not a natural LDL. That is not what you find in healthy people. That small, dense LDL is found in people who are metabolically unwell. People have high blood sugar or high triglycerides. It does not exist by itself. It is an indicator of an unhealthy metabolism because small, dense LDL is associated with heart disease. See? But we need to think about it. It's not small. It's small, damaged LDL. Now, what else is happening when you have small, dense LDL? which happens when you have higher triglycerides, that small dense LDL is more likely to be glycated, meaning the glucose is going to attach to that small dense LDL and it's going to be less functional. It's going to hang out in the bloodstream longer because it can't bind to the LDL receptor very well. So it's ultimately then going to also be oxidized, which when you're eating fried food, so you've got the crappy American diet of French fries, which is fried in, in these seed oils, and you're ultimately going to be oxidizing your proteins. You're talking about uh, a completely poor metabolic system in which you have glycated the LDL, you have oxidated the LDL, you have damaged it beyond repair. And that's why it's associated with poor health. And to substantiate that, what I've got in this study is to show you that the people that have high SDLDL, that's small, dense LDL, are the ones here that have high triglycerides. The people who have very low SDL have very low triglycerides. The ones who have metabolic syndrome, the majority of them will have very high small dense LDL. And what are the consequences of having overall poor metabolism? It's shown beautifully in this study. And so it is the small dense LDL that is associated with heart disease and stroke. But if you look at people who have very low, this is over time, over years, you're looking over 15 years at the incidence of coronary events. The people that have very high small dense LDL have more coronary events compared to the blue down here in which they have low SDL. And this is very important. It's not the SD small dense LDL that is causing the heart disease. SDL exists in a damaged metabolism. And when we look at the healthy LDL, and that's on the right, the large buoyant LDL, which is our native LDL, it is what the liver produces when we are healthy. There is no association of that LDL to coronary heart disease, and that's on the right. This is really powerful evidence to me that says that LDL does not cause heart disease, but an unhealthy metabolism is what contributes then to heart disease. There's, I guess, you mentioned the ApoB particles, and there's 
several of them, and there's the APOB 48 and the, and the APOB 100. And there's a, a particular subcategory called lipoprotein little a, which right. a lot of people are talking about as it being a, a, a more important or independent risk factor, even though the fact that it's not in very high quantities. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about the, the different types of APOB and how we should yeah, use I'm glad you brought up subpoena your LP little a. First of all, a fantastic paper came out from a group recently, and um, primary authors escaping me at the moment, but uh, what they did was, uh, to back up for a moment, the structure of LP little a is extremely similar to LDL. And so it's a difference just of one additional protein, and that's APOA. And so when you get a blood test and you're measuring LDL, in general, the blood test doesn't distinguish LDL from LP little a because they are structurally, excuse me, so similar. What this group did was to separate LDL from LP little a because overall the LDL was associated with heart disease. But when they separated the LDL from the LP little a, LDL was no longer associated with heart disease. That's such an important point. So yes, this lipoprotein A has a very different function. And frankly, it's still a bit of a mystery as far as I'm concerned. LP little a is involved in wound healing. And it also has been demonized somewhat to say it causes heart disease. But the bottom line is LP little a is structurally similar to LDL. And when you look specifically at people's LP little a level, there tends to be an association with heart disease. Now, LP little a has been ignored for years, even though people knew it was associated with heart disease. Why is it? Because all of a sudden we're developing, we're seeing drugs that can target LP little a. The PCSK9 inhibitors reduce LP little a. And in fact, the reduction in heart disease events with the PCSK9 meds appears to be entirely related to that drop in LP little a. Uh, bottom line is, evolution didn't create lipoproteins to cause us to have heart disease. Each lipoprotein has a function. LP little a appears to be involved in wound healing, which is ultimately potentially related to clotting again. It all seems to funnel down to clotting. Um, what I would say is an LP little a is reduced by low carb diet, by the way. You will often see in the literature, LP little a is not affected by diet. And that's because all of those studies they cite are low fat studies. The low fat study doesn't lower LP little a. There is some indication. Jeff Volick has some work and there's some other studies showing that carbohydrate reduction diet reduces LP little a. We included that in our review of, of a low carb diet. The yeah, bottom yeah. line is we need to just understand we've got different kinds of lipoproteins all involved basically in, in our metabolism. The demonization of LP little a is because there are now drugs being developed to reduce LP little a. Interestingly, LP little a apparently is also reduced by saturated fat in the diet, which is obviously not what they want to promote. And just out of just out of curiosity, my LP little a, which I had measured several years ago, was two. It was about as low as you, it comes. So I thought that, that was quite funny. Low. Yeah, my LP little a is also ex extremely low. You're absolutely right. And in fact, the more saturated fat is associated with reduced LP little a. I, I've seen that work. I've also seen work with saturated fat and people with familial hypercholesterolemia, which potentially even does not increase LDL levels. So again, that's an entire topic that I'm sure um, we, we could have talked about, but uh, clearly there's been the demonization of saturated fat, whether it's from tropical oils or from uh, animal-based food which of course uh, is not based on strong uh, literature foundation. Yeah. Um, let me also show you, this is also this is a study on stroke. And again, um, the people who have more strokes have more clotting. It's very straightforward, it's obvious. Especially when you're looking at ischemic stroke, you're looking at clots and it's largely, it's independent of LDL. The people who have more strokes have more small dense LDL. Again, it's the people who have metabolic syndrome. The people have the hyperglycemia have far more strokes. So the, I think the important message is that yes, LDL can be damaged just as any other molecule. Hemoglobin is going to be damaged by high blood sugar. 
if you don't have that high blood sugar, you don't have the hypertension, you're not damaging your arteries and you're not damaging your proteins. You're not damaging your cornea. Another way of looking at it is that high blood sugar is damaging your cornea. The same way it's damaging your arteries. You don't have hypertension, don't have hyperglycemia. With a carnivore type diet, and you're not going to be having that, that preceding damage that is found then in which LDL may be associated with heart disease. I, by the way, on that topic, you just mentioned LP little a. So this was a review that we published three years ago. I was really fortunate to work. Blair O'Neill is a cardiologist and Jeff Olick is just an absolute expert in uh, nutrition. Of course, your group of no low carb diet. And I want to show you in this review, when you compare low fat diet with low carb, what you got is dramatic increase in a large buoyant LDL, a little bit of a change, a small increase in LDLC, increase in HDL. And over here on the right, we had a couple of studies showing that LP little a was also reduced. But the blue is all going in the right direction when people go on a low carb diet. And it's look at all these different measures. Small dense LDL drops dramatically on the low carb diet. And frankly, it, it, whether it's uh, all carnivore or omnivore, you see these, these same benefits. The critical factor is going on the low carb diet. Uh, oh, and oh, I'm really glad I included this. Here is that paper I was just referring to. This was published in Journal of the American Heart Association a few years ago. This is, and the leader is when the LP little a cholesterol content was excluded from the measurement. LDL was no longer associated with cardiovascular disease. This is the paper I was referring to before. LDL was associated with cardiovascular disease only when the LP little a component was included. This is huge, and yet it's been entirely ignored, despite being published in a really good quality journal. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, now, I, no, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I remember reading that study, and I know that Dr. Simicus is, I, he calls himself the LP little a doc. Right. I think that that's his handle right. on Twitter, and so I followed some of his work. And yes, it's curious that they that, that really hasn't gotten more traction than, than, than it has, and I guess probably because there weren't any drugs directed to it. And as you say, now that the drugs are out, now we'll talk about it a little more, perhaps. Yeah. Now, maybe we should just finish up. And I talked a little bit about statins, and because this is how you promote, this is from an ad. Crestor, and she has reduced her heart attack incidence by or potential by 54 percent and uh, this is how the statin research is presented to physicians and at conferences and here's an actual graph i got from from a cme course so i look at how physicians are being educated and this is the reduction in coronary events with in the Jupiter study, which was Crestor, also called Resuvastat. And so when you look at this graph, and if you're a physician at a conference, you say, wow, overall 44% reduction in events. Um, and let me show you here. This is from the primary investigator, Paul Ritker, who ran the Jupiter study. And the arrow is pointing to a 54% reduction in myocardial infarction. That's a heart attack. So on the right, just to show you, there's no bias of mine at all. I'm showing you how Paul Ritker presents this. And realize this was supposed to be a four-year study. They stopped it at 1.9 years, they said, for ethical concerns. There was such a dramatic reduction in heart attacks and death that they had to stop the study at 1.9 years. Now, what is also happening, I don't have a slide on this, is people are developing diabetes. And you're seeing overall a doubling in the incidence of diabetes in, with statins. But let's look at what the actual 54% was. That on the left, 54% risk reduction. The graph shows the actual percent of people without a heart attack. And I put in 99% to show you that more than 99% of the people in the study did not have a heart attack. They were horribly uncooperative. Almost nobody had a heart attack in this study. And yet, there's a 54% reduction between the red bar and the blue bar. How can that be? The actual percent of people that had a heart attack on Crestor, 31 people, only 31 people out of 8901 had a heart attack. That's 0.35%. 
People have a SIBO. Only 68 out of 89 or 1 had a heart attack. That's 0.76 percent. If you, if you were at the beginning of the study and you say to your doctor, given I have the same characteristics as these people in the Jupiter study, what's my chance of not having a heart attack? The answer is 99.2% chance of not having a heart attack if you do nothing. Digest that. So what's the difference between the two groups? 0.41, which I have in the middle. And, and again, this is straight out of the study. 0.41% is the actual benefit of the Crestor, difference between the drug and no drug. And yet they say that it's a 54% reduction. How can that be? 0.41 is 54% of 0.76. This is why I say this is just outright deceptive because people don't know that almost nobody had a heart attack in the study. And I like to show this little guy here and say, come on now, seriously? You're turning 0.41% into 54%. That's not right. We published a paper saying that this has been routine in statin studies for 40 years, that they have taken minuscule benefits and inflated it to make it appear as if statins are wonder drugs, and they're not. Let me ask you because this is a study of, of short duration, under two years. Incident rate is pretty low with heart disease. But if we look at the lifetime risk, a, a high percentage of people do eventually succumb to heart disease. And so they'll say, if you've got a, in your lifetime, you've got a 40% risk of dying of heart disease, that's a bigger number than 0.5% or something like that. And then they start talking about these reductions over time, over, over 40, 50 years. What do you say to that when they say we do have a, a lifetime reduction in risk, which is more significant? Sure. It's a valid point. First of all, what they always like to point out, the statin advocates like to point out, is, well, if you take that, whether it's, and here the actual, here's a study looking overall, the average benefit for statins, when you look at absolute risk, is about 1%. 2%, less than 1% per stroke. So the real benefit, this came out in JAMA, internal medicine. The real benefit is very small, but it is positive. And the, these authors also want to credit them saying, most people who took the statins basically derived no clinical benefit. <clears throat> but as you say, these are relatively short-term studies. They last only a few, two, three years. It's very rare for a statin study to last more than three or four years, and you take that 1% over two or three years and look at a lifetime, and if hundreds of millions of people are taking the statins, that translates into a large number of people, therefore, are actually benefiting, even if it's only 1%. And I would agree, any drug that helps 1% of the people without causing harm actually cannot benefit. That's when we need to look at adverse effects. The 1% benefit would be great. Now let's look at what the FDA says about statins, which have clearly been downplayed by the statin advocates, liver, and diabetes, muscle injury, memory loss. And I just want to, I just want to point out just a, a couple of studies. <clears throat> this I find remarkable. You read that. So in this review by the American Heart Association on statin safety, they acknowledge that statins can produce non-serious, reversible forgetfulness, confusion, and cognitive impairment. Now, if you're a doctor and your patient gets medication that causes him or her to become forgetful, I don't know how you can call that non-serious. I find that adjective a little odd. But let's look at a study okay, on people on statins. Again, keeping in mind, there's a slight benefit. But let's look at this study, published over a decade ago. These are 75-year-old men and women, all diagnosed with dementia. So these are people already going to the physician, serious memory problems, diagnosed with dementia, all of whom are on a statin. All of these people were taken off the statin and then tested a month later. The dementia was completely reversed. They are no longer diagnosed with dementia. Now, 
what's crucial? The dementia returned when they were once again put on the statin. And the, these patients are just put on these medications. It's partially, you can think of this as blind. They confirmed when their cholesterol went up, they're taking all the statin. A month later, they're tested. Their memory is now normal. When they put them back on the statin, they're once again diagnosed with dementia. This is only one study. It, it, it doesn't confirm that all statins have an adverse effect on the brain. But with tens of millions of older adults on statins, and I'm saying the benefits are really trivial, the question is, what percentage of those people on the statin have adverse effects on their brain functioning and because of the drug, not because there's an organic disorder of the brain? Now, um, uh, over a decade ago, or actually it's like about a decade ago, because the brain has something called the blood-brain barrier. Not all drugs can get into the brain. It has a level of protection. So not all statins can get into the brain. And this is why it's really important not to just look at a review of all statins. Some drugs, such as Crestor, don't get into the brain very well. Lipitor gets into the brain very easily. So it passes through this blood-brain barrier. And so it depends on how fat-soluble the statin is. We published this paper looking at the structure of the statins in relation to reports to the FDA of cognitive impairments. And what we found was that it's the statins that have the structure that can allow them to get into the brain that have the highest incidence of cognitive events, adverse cognitive events. And then when we look at the combined two studies, that study I just showed you in which we had people reporting dementia, that most of those people were on the drugs that we had said we would predict would cause dementia. Because what's happening is the brain produces its own cholesterol. The cholesterol is so important to the brain that it actually doesn't allow peripheral cholesterol to get into the brain. Cholesterol doesn't get past the blood-brain barrier. The brain has the machinery to produce its own cholesterol. And so when the statins that can get into the brain block that metabolism, block the HMG-CoA in the brain, the enzyme, and the brain doesn't produce enough cholesterol. It can't make new brain cells. It can't produce new synapses. It's impaired in making new memories. It produces a dementia-like effect. So overall, statins may not actually have an adverse effect on brain functioning because you've got a mixture of different kinds of statins. But looking specifically, for example, at Lipitor, which can get into the brain, then you're finding a high percentage of those people are the ones reporting to the FDA that they have adverse events. You know, recently uh, there was another study came out looking at, I think, I believe it was insulin resistance and showed a pretty significant relationship between statin use. And I can't remember the lipophilicity or, or not, but let me ask you, when it, when it comes to these adverse events, um, is it the drug itself and some of the sort of the off-label or the pleomorphic effects, or is it the fact that the cholesterol is just being lowered that's causing these side effects? And, and are we, could, would we expect to see the same thing with these other drugs? It's PCS yeah. guides and so on and so forth. It's a good question. I don't think I have a definitive answer, but it does appear to be specific to the statins because specifically the action of the statins, which they all block the enzyme that ultimately produces the cholesterol, but has different effects on metabolism. So it doesn't just block production of cholesterol. It's also blocking production of precursors to cholesterol. And there's molecular work in animal work and in vitro work done in test tubes, specifically showing that statins interfere with the function of pancreas cells, which is probably why the statins, but not these other drugs, are associated with type 2 diabetes. The PCSK9 drugs, as well as benpidoic acid, were not found to be associated with diabetes. And it's because they have a very different mechanism. So it does indicate that it's because the statins can act specifically at the pancreas, at the beta cells that produce insulin, that it's interfering with both insulin producing cells and perhaps insulin receptors. So I don't think it's just low LDL per se. Uh, I think it has more to do specifically with statin action. And when I said, by the way, I want to substantiate. So here's a beautiful study. And I said that statins can double the incidence of diabetes. I'm not talking about 1% to 2%. This is a very important study. This is a rare study funded by the government. 
and this I believe was this was in Norway or Sweden, and they had people. This is the way study should be done. This is a six-year study, planned to be six-year, went out six years, and they have broad range of measurements to test for diabetes. And what you're finding then is spontaneously, these people who nobody had diabetes at the beginning of the study, 6% on the placebo developed diabetes and a little over 11% developed diabetes were on the statins. And this is a controlled, randomized placebo trial. So this is what I'm saying. This increase in diabetes is significant. It's important because now these people are significantly more likely to develop a range of disorders, including Alzheimer's disease and cancer, as well as heart disease and stroke. So the statins themselves are increasing risk of the typical Western uh, diseases. Statins are also interfering with people's energy utilization. So they're less able to exert themselves when they're exercising. So you're having an overall adverse effect on metabolism with statins. And I'm, there's so many studies. It's remarkable to me, and you may, may be referring also eventually to the nocebo effect. This is a, a, a ridiculous finding. But doctors have now been told that the statin adverse effects are not real. It's all in people's heads. That, in fact, people are told when you take a statin, you're going to have adverse effects like muscle pain. There are just so many papers, and I'm showing here in this slide a subset of the papers that have been published that show physiological effects, erectile dysfunction. Of course, you're going to reduce testosterone when you take a statin because cholesterol is essential for testosterone. Increased risk of kidney disease, especially you're looking at more tendonitis that occurs with the statins. And these are in peer-reviewed medical journals. So when your question is, if you got the high cholesterol and you take a statin and you have a 1% benefit, I say that'd be fine if there weren't any adverse effects. But the adverse effects are very real. They've been described for over a decade, decades in the medical literature. So this is really what people should be concerned about. And it's what doctors, I think, should be obligated to share this information with their patient when they are recommending that they take a statin. Yeah, it seems like we've gotten a little lax with informed consent in recent years <laughs> on a lot of things. Well, but. I wouldn't, let me, uh, let me say, and here are just some other studies. I wouldn't say it's lax. And as a scientist, in a sense, it's so much easier for me because I'm not, in a sense, as a physician, you have some responsibility to give the best care for your patient. You also have guidelines you follow. And frankly, in my experience, majority of physicians follow the guidelines blindly. I mean, you have probably seen that from your from collaborators and from other, other physicians. But as a scientist, I just review the literature and I have that luxury. I can search the literature for adverse effects of statins. The real problem, I think, for physicians is that they depend heavily on the key opinion leaders who are not telling them about the adverse effects. The American Heart Association is not telling people, emphasizing the adverse effects. As I have here some papers on cancer, increased cancer um, rate, as well as bone quality and tendinopathy. Um, doctors are not doing the research themselves to find these papers, and it's not being presented to them by the key opinion leaders. And that, I think, is the problem. So let me ask you this question, David. So if who in your mind would benefit from statin low or not statin lowering from lowering of cholesterol? Uh, maybe somebody's acutely after a heart attack, perhaps secondary prevention. I don't know. Maybe no one. I don't know. And then how would you do it? Is there somebody that needs it to have their cholesterol lowered? So it's interesting. So your question, the context is still high cholesterol must be bad. So we need to lower it. My answer is, there is no evidence, and from some of the work I presented to you today, there is no evidence that cholesterol at any level itself causes harm. And it's, it's, it's almost like saying we should have a drug that lowers the number of white blood cells we have, just in general, because when you have high white blood cells, that means it's associated with being sick. And the answer is, of course not. The reason why you have more white blood cells is because the body's responding to an infection. It doesn't make any sense simply just to kill off white blood cells. 
I, I think cholesterol is the same way. We need to think about cholesterol as benefiting us. There is no intrinsic harm to having high cholesterol. Now, that actually leads us to my paper that I had the pleasure to write with Ben Bickman and, and Paul Mason. Even though the title says statin therapy is not warranted, it's not warranted for someone who is healthy. And I think there are numerous studies, and, and, uh, and I'll show you here. Here is a study that shows, this is very important, it's related to your question. This huge benefit of statins for people, we compare in this study, people had high triglycerides on the left and low HDL. And we compare the people on simvastatin on the left side here in red, and we're looking at coronary events versus placebo. This is not a 1% effect. This is a huge 15% lowering of the incidence of heart attacks on the left side of this graph. So in this case, you can see, wow, the statin had a massive benefit to these people. And this is actually independent of their LDL levels because we look to the right, same study, okay? This is a study on called the 4S study, which was done almost 30 years ago. But you've got people that have low triglycerides and IHDL, which means they're healthy. And these are all for secondary prevention. This is all in people who either had a heart attack already or they're at extremely high risk of a heart attack. Then they're put on the statin. On the left side, you are seeing people who have a huge benefit of taking the statin. Now, why is it they benefited? I would assert that the reason why they had a benefit has nothing to do with LDL because both groups have a reduction, an equivalent reduction of LDL. It's because of the pleiotropic effects of the statins, blocking the clotting and the inflammation. Now, you could say, therefore, people with high triglycerides and low HDL should be on a statin because they will benefit. And I would have to give you a qualified agreement to that because there's a benefit to the statin. But what's the alternative? The alternative is you get those triglycerides down, you raise your HDL, and it's a real easy way to do that. And that is lower the carbohydrates in your diet. If people are willing to make the change in their diet and lifestyle, then they can put themselves into the group on the right. If someone says, I am unwilling to change my diet, I don't give a damn, I'm gonna smoke and I'm gonna drink and I'm gonna eat crap and I'm gonna have high triglycerides, then just give me a pill. And frankly, that person will potentially now have a benefit as far as reducing heart attacks, but that person is also more likely because of the statins to worsen their diabetes to worsen their increase in other metabolic disorders. There may be increasing their chance of having cancer and Alzheimer's because of the statin. As far as I'm concerned, if you're looking to improve your outcome, when you have high triglycerides and low HDL, I would prefer that someone, as I did, change their diet rather than depend on taking a pill to improve their health. You had touched a little bit on the coronary artery calcium scan as a as a indicator of future, future coronary risk, which a lot of people believe it's a strong one. A lot of people are critical of that, saying it ignores soft plaque and you can't see that. Do we know if coronary artery calcium is associated with some of these other risk factors? There was a Danish heart registry study that came out last year where they showed that if, if CAC is zero, LDL cholesterol is basically irrelevant. What right. what makes us have coronary artery calcium? And, and, and some of the people will say, the pro-statin people will say, statins drive coronary artery calcification, which stabilizes soft plaques. What, what are your thoughts around that sort of topic? Yeah, I love this. This is remarkable. So first, I'm glad you brought up the coronary calcium, which is the single best indicator of future coronary events. Looking out over 10 years, it can predict over 10 years, but basically over 99% accuracy, whether or not someone's going to have a heart attack or stroke. If you've got zero coronary calcium, you're almost guaranteed, if you continue with whatever diet and lifestyle you have, not to have a coronary event. Everyone agrees that it is the single best indicator of future coronary event. Everyone indicates 
that any increase in coronary calcium puts you at risk of having a heart attack. <laughs> now, I can imagine what happened when the studies have come out, there's multiple studies, quite conclusive, that statins without a doubt increase coronary calcium and significantly. I, I can only imagine, imagine the pro-statin people are all huddling up saying, we have a problem. <laughs> we know that more coronary calcium is bad. Statins are increasing coronary calcium. What are we going to do about this? Ah, and then the light bulb goes off. When statins increase coronary calcium, it's a good thing. This is absurd. This is like take, this is like double thing, taking something that is clearly bad and turning it into something that is good. Now, what they will say is that because statins are increasing coronary calcium, it is stabilizing the plaque. It's making it less likely it will rupture. This is based entirely on conjecture. There is no evidence whatsoever. This is when you have an industry and people supported by an industry that depends on selling statins, that they have turned something bad into something good when the statin causes it. Now, it is the case that the coronary calcium doesn't show you the soft plaque. Soft plaque ultimately can become a hard plaque or uh, uh, calcium-based plaque. Uh, the other abs absurdity to think about it is they say the coronary calcium only gives you 10-year warranty, so 10 years in which you know you won't have a heart attack. You should still be on a statin, but you might have a heart attack in 20 years. Again, that's the kind of thinking that says, I'm being funded, I'm sponsored by statins, i got to figure out a way to get people on statins. Because if you are 50 or 60 years old and you've got zero coronary calcium, that is like telling you whatever you have been doing has been right. That is giving you years and years in which you can expect not to have a heart attack. Why should you go on any medication? Why should you change anything when that zero is confirming you've been doing the right thing? And as you say, the title of the paper was The Power of Zero. When you have zero coronary calcium, that is so clearly confirming that everything you are doing is right. You are almost guaranteed not to have a coronary event. It's also telling you how healthy you are because the coronary calcium is unrelated to your LDL level. Now, it is associated with poor health, metabolic syndrome, higher blood sugar. So what happens is when you have damage to your artery, then as a part of that reconstruction of the artery, calcium can come in. Also, if you have low, in theory, low vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 helps you direct calcium to the bones. It's absolutely essential. It works with vitamin um, D to direct calcium to the bones. If you have insufficient vitamin K2, which we get from animal products, cheese and eggs and liver, when you have sufficient vitamin K2, then your calcium, excuse me, spontaneously gets absorbed into soft tissue, including the arteries. So potentially, what you want to be sure of is consuming lots of animal products gives you the vitamin K2. And certain cheeses have high vitamin K2, such as French and Dutch cheese. So if you've got the K2 and you don't have metabolic syndrome, then you're keeping the calcium out of your arteries. You're keeping your endothelium healthy. You're keeping your blood sugar low. There is simply no reason for there to be a necrosis or a damage to the arteries, which will precede the development of the plaque. Yeah, I think I've seen with zero, if you've got a zero calcium score, the odds of you having soft plaque are much lower than somebody that has something else. And then I guess you said if you've got a zero coronary calcium score, just keep doing what you're doing. But there's an, an age caveat to that because you get people that are getting their CAC scores done in their 20s and it's, you expect that to be zero. Is there after a certain age, wow. keep doing what you're doing? Yeah, there's some really great work that's out that has looked at people from their 50s to 80s and has compared future events. So you're looking over the next 10 years at events. And I can get this paper for you if you like. What's so impressive is that if your coronary calcium is over, I believe it was 100 or 200, and you're in your 50s, you are more likely to have a heart attack than someone in your 80s with zero coronary calcium. Independent of age, 50 through 80s, if you have zero coronary calcium, you have almost no incidence 
of heart disease in the next 10 years. If your coronary calcium, and I believe it's two or 300, if it's over two or 300, it's independent of age. You, whether you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, you're at significantly greater uh, likelihood of developing uh, heart disease. Now, for those of people, though, who now become alarmed, because there are lots of people now with no symptoms um, who get a coronary calcium test and they end up with a two or three or 400, there is reason to be concerned. But what I think is really important is the change in time. If your coronary calcium is stable, then you actually have significantly reduced likelihood of having a coronary event. If it is increasing noticeably every couple of years, then to me, that's an indication that what you're doing is wrong. And you do see increases with statins and potentially, it's not really studied enough, but we have a dramatic increase in heart failure that's occurred over the last few decades that coincides with statin use. And I understand that statins impair muscle function. The heart being a muscle, it is potentially very relevant that the statins are contributing to heart failure. This is a very nice study on heart. When people are diagnosed with heart failure, this is a very high incidence of death within the next few years. Very nice study published in which people are diagnosed with heart failure and taken off of their statins, and you have an extremely low rate, almost no death within the next three to five years uh, from heart failure, compared to the average is like 40 to 50% of people die after being diagnosed with heart failure. Ultimately, what we're looking at is progression over time. I would say the statins are increasing coronary calcium. It's potentially increasing your chance of having heart failure. If you're not on a statin, but you're seeing a progression in the increased coronary calcium, I think that's telling you something's not right. And it may be as simple as increasing dietary or supplemental sources of vitamin K2. Let me ask you just a kind of a hypothetical, David, because I see this all the time. And somebody will say, hey, I just started a low-carb diet. And my LDL cholesterol skyrocketed up pretty high. That's all the information you have. And that's what I get a lot of times. Hey, what do you think of my lipids? And I usually tell them I don't have enough information. What do you think if somebody's in that situation, they've started a keto, a carnivore, a low-carb diet, their LDL cholesterol is high, their doctor's getting on them about it. How would you approach that? What would you say? How, what would you get more information or what would you, or would you just say just ignore it? Or what do you do in that situation? First, my last slide. I would direct them to our paper because we laid out, I mean, it's got hundreds of references. It's an extensive review of the diet literature, the LDL literature, specifically what you need to be concerned about. So here's just our uh, summary slide. Um, benefits and, and the low carb, I think in general, we're also talking about carnivore diet. I think it's very important to get across that we need to understand, we need to appreciate that we have been deceived. And I, again, I want to cite Nadir Ali, who I have tremendous respect for. He is an interventional cardiologist. And he said at the last meeting, the Low Carb Denver meeting, the American Heart Association is the most corrupt organization in the world. We need to appreciate that we have been misled as to fear high LDL. Again, it's not my words. That's actually coming from an interventional cardiologist who's absolutely brilliant, who's a scholar. And you have so many others that I have great respect for. I would say that when that patient comes to you and is concerned about high LDL, what I think you should share with them is our paper, but also understand that there are so many other factors that are so much more important that have been shown to contribute to heart disease, to stroke, as well as more broadly to cancer and Alzheimer's. And we describe that in our paper, that ultimately what we really need to appreciate is that high LDL alone in a healthy person has not been shown even to be associated with heart disease. Specifically, for example, People with familial hypercholesterolemia who do not have metabolic syndrome, who don't smoke, who don't have hypertension, do not have any greater incidence of cardiovascular disease than the general population. And that's one of the best ways to look at this. It is the total metabolism that then contributes 
to the diseases of Western society. It is the damaged cholesterol that contributes then, in a sense, to the metabolic fire that's burning, fans the flames. Reduce that metabolic damage by reducing the blood sugar, by getting the blood pressure down. And even though I'm not against medication, I think the best way is to reduce weight and exercise appropriately to get that blood pressure down into a healthier range. That's the best strategy. And ultimately, I would suggest that people ignore elevated LDL. Now, and, and you know that Dave Feldman is now uh, has a beautiful study running in which they're looking at people who are on low-carb diet and have very high LDL levels. And the initial finding is that these people have incredibly low coronary calcium. They have very low evidence of atherosclerosis. Potentially, we're looking to his research that I think will be able to inform us as to whether high LDL for an otherwise very healthy person is, is or is not harmful. Yeah, I think he said he'll finish collecting that data in February of 2024. And I, like you, I saw the preliminary data and it's quite intriguing. One study that probably will not change the landscape of cardiology, I, I would doubt it. What do you think it's going to take? Do we already have enough information there to say that this is the way it is and we don't need to worry about LDL cholesterol? Or do you think it's going to take some landmark studies published, done to do that? Or is it just going to take a different way to make money? Like I say, they're going to make more money on the lipid low, on the glucose lowering drugs, so then they'll switch. But what do you think it's going to take? I think it's going to take people like you and me, people who are setting aside conventional, the conventional approach, which is the pharmaceutical approach. Because we have to realize that to a great extent, modern medicine is, a, is driven by medication. We have to realize that just the dramatic conflict of interest we have with the selling of products to produce health. Rather than change diet and lifestyle, it's so easy for people to want to take a pill. And I say taking a, a, a pill does not produce overall good health. I'm not against medication. There are times when there are benefits to medication. But we have to just realize the tremendous influence the pharmaceutical industry has over medical education, over the government. It's not going to come from the top. The American Heart Association is extremely well funded by the food and drug industry, and they're not about to change that. I, I think this is going to have to come from the ground up. It's going to have to come from physicians such as yourself who are questioning what you were taught in medical school and questioning what the, the guidelines are. And, and I've had the pleasure now to get to know so many physicians, including cardiologists, who are realizing that we've been given the incorrect information, specifically about cholesterol and about the need for cholesterol-lowering medication. So uh, ultimately, I'm saying we have to use the internet to get this information out there because we can't depend on the major organizations. We can't depend on the American Diabetes Association, American uh, Heart Association. This is the information we're getting at these low-carb meetings, at metabolic health meetings, and, and getting more physicians to become educated uh, and to spread the word, as you and so many other physicians are doing. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think it's this is going to be, it's going to come from the grassroots. I Like I said, I don't think tomorrow morning the president's going to come up there and tell everybody to stop eating junk food and go on a low-carb diet. It's not going to happen. The American Heart Association, as you said, is not going to suddenly reverse course anytime soon until, like I said, I think when the profits align, that's when we'll see the major shifts. That's my 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 thought on that. But well, Let me also tell you why there's such critical of use of low carb and certainly carnivore diet. Realize what happens when people go low carb. Think of the industries that are getting hurt. You are hurting agriculture because people are no longer consuming bread or cereal. And so when you go carnivore, there's a massive loss of bread. And so I think there's a strong anti carnivore, anti low carb approach because again, you're hitting the revenues of these major companies. People aren't buying corn. They're not buying grains. 
And so they're not buying cereal. There's so many foods. They're not buying orange juice. There is so many foods that people are not buying and are not consuming when they go low carb or carnivore. And I think that's part of the problem. There isn't a lot of money, frankly, in, uh, in low carb or carnivore. And that I think is, has been uh, part of the problem. And that's why it gets targeted, uh, especially by those who are part of industry. Yeah, fair enough. Dave, we've almost gone two hours. My goodness. I usually only go an hour wow. on these. So <laughs> that was good. That was very, there's a lot. Of, I don't know if people would have the patience to, to listen to all that. Let's, uh, let's hope they do. Yeah, I hope so. So there's a lot of information. Anyway, anything else you want to share? I think we'll have to shut this one down here pretty soon. So anything else you want yeah, to share? Yeah, I think we've, we've really covered so much. And I'll be at Low Carb Boca in January. So I'm looking forward to talking there um, as well. I, I really look forward to sharing this at the conferences and looking to publish some more papers. Wonderful. Well, keep up the good work, David. I'm sure I'll run into you again and somewhere. I know I'm, I'm here and there and it's exciting times. Thanks so much, David. The rest of you guys, thanks for hanging in for this one. Uh, it was a great topic and uh, keep doing what you're doing, David. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. You too. Right. Bye-bye, Bye. guys.